good afternoon. Um, I'm Tony Irwin. Uh, with me is Brian Martin. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, migrating a uh, monolithic app um, to microservices on Cloud Foundry, sort of the uh, experiences that uh, we're having um, with the Bluemix UI. And uh, just to give to level set, the uh, IBM Bluemix is, is an open standards cloud platform that's you know, has a PaaS layer built on Cloud Foundry, of course. And uh, the UI that we're going to be talking about is uh, the front end to our Bluemix um, platform. And uh, it, it's a, uh, you know, there's, there's a fair amount to the UI. Um, just, you know, some small little screenshots here. Um, but, you know, we have a home page, as you might expect, some marketing pages, um, information about pricing, um, a dashboard um, that shows you your app status and services bound to your apps and those sorts of things. Um, a catalog and a, a separate uh, page also for uh, uh, managing your orgs and spaces. Now, we started this like two, two and a half years ago probably, and uh, we've ended up with a bit of a monolith, or not, not a bit of a monolith, but an actual monolith. Uh, <laughs> it's a single page application. Um, the, the front end, um, the UI, the browser side is, is all in Dojo. Um, how, how many non-IBMers here have used Dojo? So, <laughs> so that'll be a theme that we'll talk about here in a bit. Um, but we, so we've got this big, you know, we're loading all of our JavaScript, HTML, CSS into one uh, web page, and it's all served by a Java app that's running in Cloud Foundry. Um, this was kind of a state-of-the-art architecture in some ways, you know, kind of when we started. Um, you know, now if you've been to the various talks, you know, microservices are the, the thing. Um, but even, even with that, you know, single-page applications are still, they're still popular. They're still frameworks, Angular, JS, et cetera, that sort of um, go down that route. So here's, here's a, a picture of our current, uh, our, or where we started, I should say. So the you know, home solutions catalog, et cetera, running up in the browser as Dojo components. Um, the, back, the back end um, that's labeled Bluemix PaaS there, Cloud Foundry PaaS, um, has our big Java server connected to an SQL database service. Um, the bottom layer you know, is, is really the cloud controller you know, plus other APIs. Um, that, that uh, our Java server calls. In a lot of cases, calls from the, the client are just passed through uh, straight to Cloud Foundry. So the monolith is, has given us a few challenges. Um, one, when you're you know, getting all your static resources to the browser, as well as making a bunch of you know, back-end AJAX calls, um, the volume of your, your client-side requests start to create some bottlenecks. So we have some uh, performance um, issues that we would like to uh, make better. Um, we've got a number of other teams um, within IBM that want to be part of the Bluemix UI experience. And, and aside from those teams, just within my, my own team, uh, we have um, kind of sub-teams in China, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Um, I'm kind of a, an island in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, so we're very, uh, in Toronto, Canada, another place. So we're very spread out, and it's, it's kind of difficult to get sort of that continuous delivery model with a monolith um, with, with folks so spread out. Um, we we want to get to a point where we can push smaller changes as they're ready, um, you know, as the sub-teams have them ready, rather than, you know, monthly or bi-monthly um, pushes of one big code base. Um, I, I asked the dojo question earlier, and, and I don't think anyone raised their hands. Um, so, so that's one of, our, one of our issues with the monolith is, you know, it is built in dojo. Um, and, you know, when we want to uh, add to our team or hire outside of IBM, you know, where do we find dojo developers? And, and the last point there is uh, with, with the single page app and sort of the client side routing of URLs we're doing, um, our SEO, um, story isn't great. So I'll go um, 
a little bit into what we've started to do with microservices. Um, you know, sort of what we, we've hoped, you know, we're, we're, I'll, I'll show sort of where we're at. We're sort of in the early stages all in all and moving in this direction, but we think microservices will help us in this, these areas on this chart. You know, so they'll help us, you know, we want to get onto a more modern stack, really, um, a stack that um, is more performant, uh, lighter weight, um, kind of the uh, simplest um, solution uh, that will solve the problem. Um, so we, you know, we want to get to the small services. And if you saw Matt Stein's talk next door, you know, kind of talking about that service-oriented architecture, where you, you know, decompose into smaller pieces um, to solve the problem. Um, serving bare bones, HTML, CS, JavaScript, trying to get away from the huge amount of stuff that we bring over um, for Dojo. Um, a, a stack that will make it easier for um, folks to find answers on Google. Um, you know, not, not as, you know, Dojo again, sort of um, can cause problems there. Um, we think it'll help us to allow uh, more regular updates to the code. Um, and, and like I mentioned, you know, there's sort of my team or with sub teams, there's other teams within IBM, and uh, you can imagine in a large company and probably even in small companies, there's a lot of opinions about what technology stack <laughs> you should build on, right? Um, so we believe microservices will help give teams some flexibility. Not everyone has to use, you know, Node and Dust like we're kind of starting with, you know, and not everyone has to use, you know, someone could still use Dojo if they wanted. Um, you know, teams don't have to wait on others necessarily with these loosely coupled um, pieces. And um, by moving to microservices, we're sort of, and, and you'll see on the next slide, I'll just go ahead and go there. Um, you know, we introduce a proxy layer, um, which helps us, instead of doing our client side routing, we can now um, do um, friendly, cleaner URLs which helps our uh, SEO story. So this is actually uh, a diagram that represents um, where we are today in this migration. Um, remember the top box had you know, six or seven little purple boxes in it. We started to push those boxes down behind the proxy now. So home and solutions, kind of our more static um, pages are now sitting behind the proxy. Um, we have a, a common microservice um, which is sort of intended for other microservices to call um, to get things like the header and footer, so that can be shared. Um, the monolith is still back there, but it, now it's behind the proxy. And uh, you know, we've we've start. You know, there's some other little boxes here. This is kind of simplified, but you know, we, we're also using services for session store and those sorts of things. And I might just um, drop quickly into a demo to show what's live now. <clears throat> so this is a, you know, the Bluemix UI, actually live running code. And this is our dashboard. So this is actually being served um, from our monolith. This is one of our more um, dynamic pages um, that we have not yet started to break apart. But if I click, say, on solutions, that's actually being served from one of our, our microservices. So that solutions um, uh, microservice I showed. And I don't know if, uh, yeah, so if I actually click on the URL, you see now it's bluemix.net slash solutions. So we have a friendly URL, it's routed through our proxy and to our solutions uh, microservice. If I click on the home icon, this goes to the home microservice. And if I click back on the dashboard, then it's the monolith. And you notice we've, you know, we've tried to make it look like it's still all one <laughs> single page application, but these are actually um, separate HTML pages being served by, by separate services. Let's see, I've lost the presentation. Okay. Need some microservices to help me run the Mac here. Okay. All 
All right, so that, so I showed the, the slide and, and just gave a demo of this architecture. I, I mentioned our common microservice. That is kind of one interesting thing we're doing um, to help bring some consistency to the whole thing. Um, the page at the bottom shows our, our home page, and it's, you know, as you might expect, has a header and a footer. Um, all of our microservices call this common uh, microservice to get an HTML snippet, basically, to insert both places. So this allows our microservices to have a consistent look and feel, and, and if other teams you know, build on a, you know, another stack, as long as they're using HTML, they can call our common microservice, and at least we all share the same header and footer that way. So this is where we want to get to, of course. We want to eliminate um, in this picture, um, the, the Java monolith has been eliminated. Um, we've moved all of, uh, we've added dashboard and pricing and orgs and spaces and catalog down below the proxy. Um, this is still going to take us some time, but, but it's uh, the direction we're headed. Now, of course, there are some new challenges, as you might expect, um, in this world. Um, there's more more moving parts, uh, more complexity. Um, again, if you were <laughs> at the chat next door for the last, uh, um, just before us, by Matt Stein, there was a lot of, of talk about some of the challenges and how to manage those challenges as you break things apart. Um, collecting status and monitoring the health of, of this ecosystem is more difficult. Um, seamless navigation with the monolith, I just sort of demoed how we've done that, but there's um, some challenges, and you, you'll still sort of notice some, pl some places um, that we want to make better where maybe the header doesn't show up right away when you're toggling between the two. Um, developer skills, now I've, now I've mentioned this new stack and microservices will help, help us with developers and find new developers, but the developers we have, we're still all sort of dojo experts, so there is some learning curve um, to get folks onto the, to our uh, Node.js stack. And blue-green deployments, I th threw in as another bullet, um, has been, you know, sort of a, it just makes you think about, um, about it differently, right? Because um, I think everyone, most everyone in this room may, may have at least heard the term blue-green deployment, um, where basically you, you swap URLs from your, um, your blue is the currently running one, and you switch that URL to the green, um, which is your, your candidate to promote. And so one way we've done that is, you know, the, the blue box in this case is a, is a proxy in all of our microservices. So you can consider that a, you know, a big A app, I guess, that uh, um, consolidates all those things together. Um, the green box um, is that same stack, but the brand new code. And uh, so for us to do a blue green, we can deploy that whole, whole stack and switch our main URL to that URL. Um, so that's, that's one approach we took there. Now, those of you who are astute would probably say, well, wait, <laughs> um, microservices should be able to be de deployed independently, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, I should be able to just swap out a home microservice. And uh, you know, those, those are things we can do as well. But uh, um, when we do have a whole unit that we've tested together, um, We've, we've decided not to try to swap URLs on every little um, subcomponent. <coughs> Excuse me. So now, Brian, I think uh, we'll get you on board here. Brian's going to sort of talk about some of the um, enhancements to Cloud Foundry that could help um, microservice okay. solutions. Hi. Um not sure the, oh yeah, the mic's working now. So I'm Brian Martin. I'm uh, one of the architects for the Bluemix platform. And uh, I've also been working uh, in the Cloud Foundry community for quite some time, since back in the beginning, in which uh, Bluemix was kind of a grassroots effort inside of IBM, in which you know, a bunch of volunteers uh, across IBM started uh, working on a PaaS platform. And we, you know, we really kind of developed this outside of any organizational structure in IBM. So you know, having developed uh, or used the microservices architecture from the beginning would have been really great, because we were kind of building up from this very distributed team. But uh, you know, one of the things that we want to talk about are you know, how can we 
enhance Cloud Foundry, the platform, to better enable us, us and you, our customers um, and fellow partners, to build applications using a microservices architecture uh, more effectively on Cloud Foundry. So uh, I did think uh, I, I attended Matt Stein's presentation before this one, and I think you know he had a good comment there, which was you know you have to be kind of this tall to start on this journey because. You know, if you're migrating from a monolith application to a set of microservices, it definitely increases the complexity of what you have to manage and monitor. So you need to make sure that you have everything under control before you embark upon this type of journey. So, you know, some of the features that uh, we see that can help with enabling this type of microservice architecture is having context path routing. So this is the feature that has already started uh, within the community, we have, um, you know, a committer from uh, IBM is actually working with the community to get this into the Go router, and I think this is going to be, you know, a really nice feature, especially those who are coming from, for example, a Java EE kind of mentality where, you know, you're used to being able to deploy uh, web applications with, you know, web paths onto the same host, and you come into the Cloud Foundry architecture and you can no longer you know, have multiple apps all on the same host name with different context routes. It's a bit of a shock at first. So I think you know, getting this feature in uh, will be good. And this you know, allows us to you know, efficiently start sharing cookies. Like we don't have to share cookies at a domain level if we just need something happening within the app. So for example, in the case of you know, what was happening with uh, our HUI, you know, once you're logged in and you have kind of a session with that app, you want to be able to share that session information or that session ID across just that one application, but without sharing it across you know, other applications in your domain. So having a feature like this context path routing uh, can really help with that. So uh, you know, this is a good one that's uh, already underway. I think you know, the next kind of problem that I see uh, that we may want to consider uh, tackling in the cloud finding community is the concept of an application version. So today, you know, when we deploy all these different uh, applications to Cloud Foundry, uh, you know, there's, there's no real formal concept of an application version. So we may do a blue-green deployment like Tony described, uh, deploy our app like, you know, myapp-1.0, you know, deploy a new one, myapp-1.1, and then maybe we switch the route uh, for myapp uh, to point at the new version or back and forth, et cetera. So, you know, this can work, but it definitely does complicate uh, when we talk about a distributed monitoring problem. You know, now we have, instead of having, you know, one application that we're trying to keep track of for that monolith, we may have, you know, tens or hundreds of applications we're having to keep track of. And if at the same time those application names are constantly changing, uh, that can, you know, create, you know, problems from our change management uh, database or from a monitoring database. So I think you know, it would be useful if we could you know, actually deploy multiple versions of a Cloud Foundry application, just give it you know, under the same app name, but maybe different binary versions that are versioned, and be able to easily you know, switch back and forth which one we want to run. Uh, so you know, this is still kind of a, an idea that's kind of an infancy, but you know, looking to get feedback in the community around concepts like this to see you know, what others think about it and you know, if it's a useful concept. You know, when we were talking about uh, you know, Netflix OSS, for example, there's certainly a concept of versioning that are associated with uh, applications that are deployed uh, there. Yes? Yeah, I think it can be easy to implement, and like you say, there are there are approaches that you can use to implement it on your own. But I'm I'm wondering if you know, especially when we talk about within the community, we want to build up common sets of DevOps tooling. So we want to build up you know delivery pipelines and other types of tooling. And if everyone just kind of invents their own kind of ad hoc versioning concept, then that doesn't allow us to build kind of a standard a standard set of tooling that can help us manage uh, you know all these different deployments. So I think that's where making it a formalized concept can help because then that allows us an ecosystem of tooling to, to 
you know, rise up around that API versus just, you know, having a uh, convention which doesn't allow that to occur. So advanced route, routing policies, uh, this is another key thing, and there's a lot of work uh, happening uh, within uh, the GoRouter community today to enable this in the future, and I think this is important. You know, we want to have, as we're rolling out different microservices or different bits of the app, we want to be able to have, you know, A-B testing occurring. We want to be able to set policy so that we can route, you know, some percentage of our requests to the new version, some percent to the old version, uh, maybe target specific user groups. So all of that is going to be, you know, made possible if we can get the right extensions into the Go router to enable those advanced types of uh, routing selection policies. And, uh, you know, I think this is, you know, even more important when we think about microservices. Do we need to have any type of coordination of, of different uh, bits of the microservices? You know, if we select, you know, one user for, you know, say this A-B testing, does it affect any of the other services we may need to select for that same user? So I think that's an interesting problem to, uh, to also solve. One of the biggest uh, issues I think that we see when considering to do a microservices app uh, on Cloud Foundry is what I'm, what I'm calling private applications. And this is the ability to, you know, hide microservices uh, applications from public routing. So, you know, I may have a whole set of services that are composed in my application, but I really want, you know, a, a couple endpoints like the proxy endpoint that, uh, that Tony showed in our architecture to be the one that's exposed to the end user. We don't necessarily want people to, if they could discover the URL for, you know, the billing service, we may not want to expose the billing service uh, directly, but only via uh, some other path. So an ability to, you know, really separate which parts of your application are public and which parts are private, and then, you know, potentially put those onto their own software-defined network uh, within your space or org so that only your space or org can access those microservices and you're not making them available, you know, to the world or into, you know, the flat networking space. And with regard to that, you know, we'll have to solve the problem of how do you authenticate or grant access for routing. In the case of a, a software-defined network, uh, I think that's, you know, pretty easy and obvious, but maybe we want to enable some kind of cross-space uh, or cross-org uh, access as well. So composite applications. And I, in the previous talk from Matt, you know, he was calling this kind of the big A application. But I think, you know, once you actually deploy a application that's composed of many microservices, you want to understand the health and status of your application as a complete picture. So what we, I think this leads to is a desire to have some kind of composite application that could allow you to group your applications together for status and for control, potentially. I'm not sure if you would want to control them all at once, but uh, possibly, but certainly for status, monitoring, logging, you, you want to be able to group together a set of uh, related applications so you can understand those all at once. Uh, service registry. So, you know, another thing I wanted to mention, you know, as we're talking about, you know, how we can extend Cloud Foundry to better enable uh, microservices types of apps, you know, one approach was mentioned using, you know, Spring Cloud. And, you know, while using Spring Cloud, you know, maybe an option, uh, I think, you know, one of the, the potential downsides to that, uh, that at least, you know, we would see inside of uh, IBM is that, you know, we want to be able to adopt new t technologies. So, you know, not everyone may want to run uh, with Java Spring. We may want to have some people writing in Node, some people writing in Ruby, some writing in Go. So we want to be able to compose different parts of our architecture based on the right language to solve that problem. And it may not always be, uh, you know, a particular Spring, Spring Cloud platform. So I think there's, you know, even though we can solve these problems maybe in a very specific way, if we can bring some of these services together at a greater platform level, then we can enable them, uh, you know, for everyone or all the different types of apps. So service registry is a key one of these services. You know, how do we actually discover the active endpoints for our microservices rather than having, you know, hard-coded paths or hard-coded versions and that kind of thing. So we need a place for your services to register into the service registry uh, at registration time and then a discovery protocol so that you can actually discover those and dynamically invoke them properly. Uh, part of that should include, you know, 
having routers that uh, can allow, you know, like the Hystrix type of thing and uh, a ribbon to have, you know, fast failover. So I think Tony, you know, brought this up and, you know, what we have seen as we've, you know, decomposed our application already, you know, having the, the best performance monitoring tools and log tools are really required when you're looking at this type of architecture. So, you know, when you break your application up into many microservices, uh, you know, if you have a performance problem in one of those services, you need to be able to, you know, have dashboards in place so you can easily discover, okay, my overall application is performing slow, and now I can really dig in and find out, you know, this particular part of the uh, application is the cause. So this kind of goes back to that composite application view where we can collect all the interesting statistics about the composite app together in one place, and so we can easily drill down into, you know, which microservice or which part of my application is really causing the problem. So related to that is being able to, you know, aggregate, you know, all your logs into a common log source. And then I think also a potentially missing feature uh, from Cloud Foundry is some capability to insert correlation IDs, you know, automatically into your request flow so that, you know, as we're tracking requests from, you know, one entry point into several other services, we can flow these correlation IDs along, have those contribute to the log stream so that we can really track uh, individual applications as they hit all the different services uh, within the uh, flow. Uh, Finally, I think, uh, you know, are there any capabilities that we can add in terms of testing uh, your services? So, of course, you know, as you're moving into a microservices architecture and you're deploying more and more of your services, they need to be, your testing needs to be integrated to your CI, CD pipeline. And, you know, a big advantage of this type of architecture is that you can deploy smaller chunks more often and without having to, you know, do the big monolithic deploy where all the different teams have to come together. But you know, the question that I'm kind of raising for the community here, is there anything else that we can do within the platform that's really going to make the test problem uh, easier? Because I think, uh, you know, as we have all these different disparate pieces coming together, uh, in, you know, that actually have to all work in conjunction to, you know, deliver the function, I feel like there's probably some more that could be done from the platform perspective to help you you know, go through that test life cycle. And part of it was, you know, advanced routing features like A-B testing and such. But is there anything else? And I would like to hear from the community, uh, it, you know, partners in general, if you have good ideas about how you think the platform could help you in your testing, let's, you know, let's get those, let's talk about them out on BCAP dev or otherwise. And so we can really make this a, a better platform for everyone. And, uh, that's really all I had for the uh, platform today. So, you know, if you want to reach out to me or Tony, there's our email addresses and our Twitter handles. So, that, you know, what I like to do is, you know, we threw up some ideas about how we think the platform could evolve to better support these architectures. And, you know, we shared some of the, uh, the pain that we're currently and joy, pain and joy that we're, <laughs> that we're getting from, you know, taking our monolithic application and migrating it to microservices. I, I think if, you know, really look at our team, and I, I suspect many other teams are like this, you know, we have this very distributed uh, team, you know, all around the world, every time zone. And I think, you know, that's the beauty of something like microservices, is that we can really now not have all these team members contributing into one code base that gets delivered as a single app but we can have them working on their own individual pieces, delivering them, uh, you know, developing locally within their small teams, delivering their pieces incrementally. And, uh, you know, we're already seeing the results of that, and, it, and it's really helping us out uh, quite a bit. So we're really excited about this architecture. But we are realizing that, you know, there's some cha challenges like Tony has mentioned. And I think, you know, what I like about this is that since we're, we're actually living the, the pain, we're actually developing the solutions in terms of better monitoring, better logging, uh, better deployment policies, et cetera, to enable others uh, who are going to build the same type of applications on your Cloud Foundry platform uh, to do it better. 
But you know, if you have more ideas or more input about it, you know, we'd love to hear from you. And are there any other questions in the audience right now? Yes. Yeah, so the, yeah, the question is, you know, what is the impact on networking? And I think, you know, one of the biggest impacts that I've seen on networking is that it really pushes home for me the need or the desire to have more of a tenant network, more of a software-defined network that could be more tenant private. Because, um, like I said, what I'm seeing is I decompose my application into smaller and smaller microservices. Um, you know, I, I may want to have those not be public in many cases. I want them to be more internal. And the fact that I have to today, you know, maybe they're, they're kind of hidden because you don't know their host names or their paths, and, or maybe you need some secret authentication keys. But the fact that the, they are generally available is a little bit troubling to me in general in terms of the microservices architecture. So I think, you know, one of the key things that I would like to see is move, a move towards an ability to have software-defined networking within Cloud Foundry and the ability to, to put your different parts of your applications onto different networks which are potentially private and really separate those that are public. So that, that's kind of the yeah, biggest. I would say it's, it's general, de de definitely added right. requests to the system. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, it was kind of a surprise to our, the folks who monitor our entire right. uh, fabric. Um, you know, Tony, why, why are there so many more requests? Because, you know, things come to the proxy, but then they're also going to go to right. home or they're going to go to whatever, so there's, yeah, and I think that's, that's another good point, which is, you know, do you, I think it kind of also leads you to either want to do direct routing, so what from within your application tier, do direct routing uh, to, the, uh, to the application instances, which is possible uh, via some of the new Cloud Foundry features, but you have to use smart client libraries uh, to enable that, or you want maybe to have a, a different kind of mid-tier router which is different than your front end router, potentially, because you, you may not want to come into your Cloud Foundry instance and then you know, go back through the front door again, yep. over and over and over again. So you know, th those are two patterns that we're looking at, is either like a, a new mid-tier type of routing layer, or ideally probably you know, client libraries that are tied into the Cloud Foundry, uh, essentially NATS publishing, so that they can do direct uh, access. Yes. Okay. <laughs> if you have any more questions, come come up afterwards.